Greetings from Camino Lutheran Church on the second Sunday in the season of Lent. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Before we continue with our worship, I just want to again say a special thank you to Pastor Eric Samuelson for being present and offering our message last week, as well as leading us in our congregational retreat afterwards. And for all who came, there were some uh, thoughtful pieces that came before us to think about, um, some new insights, and as well being able to hear uh, your stirring of the Spirit in you. So thank you for that. Our worship continues with the confession and forgiveness. We continue in the name of God who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us on our pilgrimage. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love. And help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again, and gathers you under wings of love. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. God of the covenant, in the mystery of the cross, you promise everlasting life to the world. Gather all peoples into your arms and shelter us with your mercy, that we may rejoice in the life we share in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Our first reading from the Hebrew Scriptures comes from Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 to 12 and 17 and 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house shall be my heir? But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Word of hope. Word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 17 to chapter 4, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example that you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them. And now I tell you, even with tears, their end is destruction. Their God is the belly and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I long for and love, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for the second Sunday in the season of Lent comes from the 13th chapter of Luke, verses 31 to 35. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that city that kills the prophets and stones those that were sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes 
in the name of the Lord. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart. They are pleasing to you and faithful to your gospel. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I can still remember it as if it was yesterday. Um, part of it was the humor of it all. But I was on what was then, back then, my yearly fly fishing trip with a group of guys I'd been doing that with for, I don't know, 20 plus years. And we were on our hike into one of the lakes, and there was four of us on that day. And as we came down in this little bend in the, in the um, gravel path, all of a sudden, out of, the, out of the bushes and the ground and the trees, jumped something. And it startled all of us, so much so my friend Carl, that he was startled so much that it caught him off balance and he ended up going down fishing gear and all. Well, once we saw he was okay, we started laughing hilariously because, of course, that's what friends do when other friends fall and, you know, they're okay. It was a grouse. It was a little tiny grouse, and here we were, what, probably 50, 100 times larger um, than this grouse was, and she had felt threatened for her little chicks, or whatever the technical term is for little baby grouse. And she wanted to protect him, even though we never saw him and they were safe in the woods, she didn't feel that way. So she jumped out, willing to attack, if you will, these big monsters in her life to keep her chicks safe. Well, we got up and we looked and we, we were like, oh, geez, that's what it was. So we got up and started to try to walk away. Well, she didn't know that. She had already gotten ahead of us on the path and she kept walking. And any time we would stop, she would come charging back at us. And then when we started to move, try to pull us away again. We were just trying to get past her so she'd know that her chicks were okay. But she was doing her job. She was protecting her little babies, her little ones that she felt threatened by. And these big monsters in front of her, she was willing to do whatever it would take to take care of them. And that's a bit of what we have in our story for our gospel lesson today with Jesus. Only he uses the image of the mother hen who desires to take her wings and spread them out and gather the children together like a brood under her wings. Maybe for those of us who've grew up, grown up in the city and haven't been around the farm life uh, very much, we might not be so familiar with a story I've heard again and again and again um, from people who've grown up on farms and around animals when a fire breaks loose. It's been many times I've heard the story of how amidst the char they'll go and they'll find a mother hen um, laying down and totally charred and charred to death and burned to death, dead. And yet when they go to lift her up and move her away, there are a bunch of her baby chicks still alive. It's the picture of a mother willing to do anything to protect her children. And so when we see our text for today in our gospel lesson, we see that imagery that that's who Jesus is. He's all about protecting life and, and holding life together, restoring life that is broken, keeping it so that the fullness of life can be experienced. That's Jesus' desire. But in our text, we see that there's three basic conflicts of desire going on here. First, there's the desire by Herod that he wants Jesus dead. Then there's Jesus' desire, and his desire is to nurture Jerusalem, to take care of them, to offer them the fullness of life amidst the dangers and realities that they're facing on a daily basis. And then lastly, we see the desire of Jerusalem, which Jerusalem wants nothing to do with who Jesus is and the message he is bringing. So let's take a step back to that first one. What's the desire of Herod? Herod, and it's important to know that the Herod we have now in Jesus' day was the son of the Herods before him, who, who was one in particular, was seen as this great leader, and he was a great thug. Now, this Herod wasn't so much along those lines, but the, 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 the son wanting to at least have the respect and authority of the father, he got placed on the outer skirts of the Roman Empire down there in this area to kind of keep the peace down in Galilee. Well, he certainly um, was one who was willing to kill the prophets. Now, even though there was an openness to listen, it is he who had John the Baptist beheaded, killed, when Herodias um, 
his wife's daughter ended up dancing, and he said, I'll give you whatever you want, even up to half my kingdom. And so what she desires after talking to her mom is the head on the platter of John the Baptist, because John the Baptist spoke against their marriage, she having come from one of his own relatives, brother, his wife, and then marrying her. So Herod's desire, you see, is a, is a willingness to kill the prophets, to kill those who come and place before he or the civic leaders, if you will, a danger that, propo that proposes at least the perception is a danger to their authority, who they are and what they're about. And Herod felt this from Jesus. The people are starting to listen to him. They're starting to pay attention to him. And so he desires to have him killed. What better to do? Or at least that's what's told to us by the Pharisees, which as we take a look at the Pharisees, you've got another sense of desire, which I'll tie in with the Jerusalem desire in just a bit. But the Pharisees had come and said, hey, Jesus, you need to get out of here. Herod is trying to kill you. And we don't know for sure in this case, um, were they actually trying to help Jesus or was this part of their whole reality of, hey, we want you to get out of here because, number one, you're kind of messing things up for us because we have a good relationship as best you can with Herod. And in our positions, things are kind of okay and we don't want to mess that up. Or Gamaliel was seen as, as one who is kind of, let's wait and see. Let's see what happens here with this Jesus uh, before we necessarily do anything. So there was a wanting to see where all these things were going to go with this Jesus that the people were following. But we do see on several occasions, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, and to be clear, it's not all of them, nor when it speaks of Jerusalem, is it meaning all the Jewish community, but those who had not been willing to receive the words of the prophets that had come. But again, I'll get back to that. So you do have these, these groups within the Pharisees, like when Jesus had the demons go out into the herd of swine and they ran off the, the cliff edge. What did they want to do? They literally wanted to toss him off the cliff edge and take his life. So we see within both these groups of leadership that there's this sense of Jesus' uh, ministry, the prophet's ministry over the years being dangerous to them. And so their desire was to kill, to destroy life, to get rid of them. Fact is, pretty much on the Pharisees, and they couldn't do that on their own. It had to be the Roman leadership that did that because Rome was in charge of the land and it was up to them to enforce such wills. So that's the desire of Herod and even the desire, as we'll touch on Jerusalem, of some of the Pharisees, it appears. But what's the desire of Jesus? The desire of Jesus, you can hear it in, in, this, um, in this reality. His desire is to care for the people. And he doesn't care what it's going to take. And he's not afraid if there's danger in the way. He looks, and upon hearing the word that Herod is trying to kill him, he says, listen, you go tell that fox. And fox, both in rabbinic literature um, and in the Greek literature, had to do with one who was sinister, um, as well as one who, uh, one who was uh, a trickster. So sinister and a trickster, if you will. Kind of see that in some Native American spirituality around the, the, the fox, uh, that, that trickster character um, that, is, that is present. And so Jesus goes back, look, I know who you are. I know what you're all about. You're concerned about your own power, your own place. You're not concerned about these people. You're willing to have them killed. You're taking money from them already that isn't yours and beyond what should be yours. So there's many issues there. But Jesus faces it head on. He's not afraid to. He says, listen, you go tell that fox, look what I've been doing. I've been casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I finish my work. It's as if he's going to stay even one more day to show he's not afraid of Herod. And he's willing to do whatever it takes to care for the people of Israel, to care for the people of Jerusalem. And the, the interesting thing is, out of the transfiguration story some four chapters earlier and a couple weeks ago, 
Jesus comes down the mountain and sets his face towards Jerusalem. But it takes some 10 chapters for Jesus to get there. Because even though he's determined to get to Jerusalem, and our text has a sense of what that reality is going to mean, it doesn't mean he's predicting the future per se, some type of woo-woo prediction, but because Jesus seems to understand human nature and human behavior. He has seen what the people of Jerusalem have done to the prophets before. Those who have come in, in God's name, they've killed, they've had stoned. So Jesus, even in the midst of knowing that and understanding that, is willing to take time, 10 chapters, several days, to meet the needs of the people along the way. So his face is set, he knows the task and destiny at hand, but what's most importantly is the most important is the people of Israel. And so we take a look just at some of the things within Jesus taking that time that he does. He heals those who are ill. He teaches disciples and crowds that follow him. He engages his opponents in conversation. He even met with several Pharisees in their houses. A lot of times around the issue of power, things would kind of devolve, if you will. But he met with them. He talked with them. He blesses children. He restores to community those that are pushed aside. He liberates those held by captive spirits that rob them of having an abundant life. He shares stories of God's unending love with the people. He encourages the people's persistence in prayer, that there is an intentionality and a relationship with God, that they get to lift their voice and then they too can hear God's direction and will for their lives. He argues for the pursuit of justice. He laments all those who refuse God, but embrace and cling instead to the protections and prizes of the world. Jesus is that mother hen wanting to do whatever he can to protect his children. His face is set to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem, that third conflicting desire, wants nothing to do with him. And by Jerusalem, I mean those within leadership positions that feel like, I was trying to think of the wording earlier um, that I would use to describe this. It's those leaders within the community, be it the Roman leaders, or the religious leaders of Jesus' day that see the prophet's message as divisive, controversial, and dangerous. Divisive, controversial, and dangerous. It's a threat to their position of power. It's divisive and controversial and dangerous to them because if the people start listening to them, what do they lose? They lose the positions that they have. Things might get stirred up, might get changed, and they were comfortable. We understand that, don't we? I mean, we've been in the midst of constant change and turmoil these last couple years. And especially in the church, we wrestle with that. It often takes churches forever to make the changes necessary that are important to carry out the mission that God's calling us to. Because maybe things are going well and it feels comfortable. But is comfortable what we're always about? Yes, we need those moments to feel comfort, to feel cared for, especially in the midst of sorrow. And, and times when we're hurting. But we as a church are called to, if you remember Jesus' words earlier in, in Luke, I've been, um, let me find, ah, I left it back there. I've been called to bring release to the prisoners and the captives and proclaim good news to those who are poor, who are hungry, who are starving. That's our role, our call as the church to go out. Jerusalem didn't want that upheaval. They didn't want to be disturbed from how things were working. And you could see, even though things might have not have been perfect for those Pharisees and religious leaders, they were pretty good. And if you disturb that, it could be worse. And oftentimes our fear of what could be worse keeps us from doing anything at all. And when we don't do anything at all, sometimes we end up in what that fear of worse is. Not because it had control, but because we allowed it to get control of us. The images in here of the three days nodding towards what's going to happen to Jesus. Jesus is willing to give his life. It's pointing us towards Jesus' entry on Palm Sunday. That the people call out for him to save them, but he saves in a different way. In a way that does not seek power in the ways of the world, but in his willingness 
to give up his life. That's the passion Jesus had for his people and his purpose as God's son. You know, no, I am not saying that he is Jesus and we're in the midst of this. But you look at what you're seeing on TV with the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, and he has a passion and a powerful sense of purpose with his people and with that country and their fight for freedom amidst the bigger machine that can literally come and is destroying them. And yet he has set his face towards that fight and has not left, though he could, but is standing to this point alongside his people. Jesus' love is so immense and powerful that he will stand by his people all the way to the fires of the chick that is burned and keeps her brood under her wings to keep them safe. The disciples are still learning what that transfiguration means. It is the deepest evident power of God's love for the people that Jesus even takes time going to Jerusalem amidst the fears of being destroyed and his life taken because there are needs to be met along the way. And he's willing to give his life for the whole of creation, not just for those of you who follow him. May God give us the strength to stand up and be firm amidst the struggles of life. May we hear the gospel and how Christ has poured out himself for us. And may we not fear what might be, but be willing to risk in the love of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to be that incredible gift and blessing, to go where the demons are, if you will, where the people are hurting and they are sorrowful, even if it means disrupting the status quo. Difficult thing to do, challenging for me to do at times. Do I be quiet? Do I speak up? God's peace, God's blessings on this journey of Lent as we see Jesus set his face to Jerusalem for you and for me. Amen.
draw close to the heart of God. We offer these prayers for the church, for the world, and for all who are in need. You gather the church into a community of mercy and grace. Unify Christians around the globe in efforts to proclaim good news, even in the face of opposition, and protect those whose lives are imperiled by the gospel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You create the entire universe and call it good. Hinder those who would cause further destruction to our planet's fragile ecosystems and augment the calls of those who advocate for thoughtful stewardship of the Earth's resources. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You raise up leaders committed to love and justice. Nurture in those who govern patience to receive criticism, openness to new ideas, and courage to change course when needed for the sake of the common good. Merciful God, receive our prayers. You hear us when we cry to you. Attend to those expecting a child and console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans to enduring post-traumatic stress. Shield those endangered by domestic violence. Uphold those who are ill or grieving. We especially remember before you today Jessica, Dana and Bradley Hopp, Kelly, our releasing friend, Linda Riffner, Ed and Donna Crow. We continue to pray for the people in Ukraine and Russia caught amidst the destruction of war. Hold them and all those offering humanitarian aid in your care and move leaders to move toward peace now. We also remember those named in our bulletin on our prayer chain and those we name aloud are in the silence of our hearts at this time. Those looking for work, those without hope. Merciful God, receive our prayers. You kindle faith that moves us into action. Guide children and adults preparing for baptism or confirmation. Empower Sunday school teachers, confirmation leaders, and parents who share their faith with younger generations. Give us all a renewed sense of vocation. Merciful God, hear our, receive our prayers. Accept the prayers we bring, O oh God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Receive these gifts which you have first given us and placed in our care to use with your wisdom. Amen.
as you journey into your week. May Almighty God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks be to God. Welcome to our announcements from the deck. We have some important ones today, not that they aren't always, but um, our first one, let's begin with, we have sent out surveys to get all of your feeling for uh, those who finding out how comfortable you are in regards to the mass changes coming up, mandates being dropped and masks being optional. And so we've been receiving several of those back in from those who were in person a couple of weeks ago, as well as those who are online. And we also sent it out via the regular mail. So we're waiting for those. And council will meet on the 17th, this Thursday. Uh, we had tried to meet last week, but unable to get more than half the group together. So we're going to take a look at all those surveys, the answers that you put down, um, CDC, state guidelines, all of those pieces, and, and make a decision as we move forward in regards to, to mass and also worship space um, in regards to, to meeting for worship. So. Please keep your keep your eye out on that. Uh, having the 17th, we will continue with our, our mass policy at least through that Sunday following the, the 17th meeting uh, so we can get the information if there are changes out to everybody. So uh, please keep an eye out for that. We will send information out via the all church email, via the mail, and as well in person. So. A safe Harbor is our Benevolence of the Month. Safe Harbor Clinic, if you're not aware of it, provides free health care. Um, it's located down in Stanwood and just a wonderful gift of ministry. Dr. James Grierson has come and spoken to our church on several occasions in regards to Safe Harbor Clinic. It's, again, for those who uh, don't have insurance, can't afford the basic health care that they need, they take care of those pieces. So. You can donate online or send a check into the church and just put Safe Harbor Clinic down in the, the memo line. Midweeks, we've started our midweeks with Holden Evening Prayer at 7 o'clock, so hope you can come out for that. The time change happened this Sunday, so it should be a little bit lighter, uh, longer for folks for driving. I know sometimes nighttime driving is an issue for some folks, so hopefully that should help out with having much lighter weather to come out for those. And the midweek offerings will be going to... Um, the humanitarian, humanitarian efforts relief, relief efforts over in Ukraine. So we've got several different organizations between Lutheran Disaster Response and Lutheran World Relief um, has connected with a church in Wisconsin that is willing to match up to, it was $200,000, but now the last I saw was like $242,000 that they'll match that. So um, any gifts that you give will go to that and hopefully... Um, just be uh, an effort to, to help in a situation that many of us would like to help in in a variety of ways as I've heard from so many of you so if you'd like to give to that uh, as part of our midweeks again you can donate on online that one you just send a check in to the to the church um, as the donation part will focus for the benevolence of the, of the month so you can send a check into the church and then last but not least uh, we are, the ladies are going to be meeting on Tuesday the 15th at 9 a.m. Marion Erickson had requested $250 from Thrivent and received it for personal care kits. So they're going to put those personal care kits together at 9 o'clock on Tuesday the 15th. So they're looking for some volunteers to come help with that. God's peace and blessings on the rest of your day and your week and look forward to connecting with you again.